Hello, good evening. Welcome. This is Ghana Tonight. We are live from News Hub here at Tadesa Wakanda. I am Alfred Akanse. Coming up tonight, another twist in the matter of the stolen cash from the home of former Sanitation Minister Cecilia Abnadapa as the Office of Special Prosecutor freezes her bank accounts containing substantial amounts of money in millions of dollars and CDs. We have the details coming up shortly. Stay with us. Also, renowned statesmen have raised concerns about the, the leadership of Ghana in uh, the three business forum held earlier today. Tonight, we bring you excerpts of the forum, including a conversation on the leadership and, and some reactions on the issues that came up earlier today. Also, the World Bank has held back on some loans to Uganda because of the country's anti-LGBTQ plus law. Tonight, we ask if there's any cause for alarm or concern for Ghana, which is currently on the verge of passing its anti-LGBTQ plus law. Stay with us. This is Ghana tonight. Let's hear from you. We're very interactive on all the social media platforms, specifically on Facebook. You can connect with us. The hashtag is Ghana tonight. Let's settle for Ghana Briefs. Sources have confirmed that the Office of the Special Prosecutor has frozen two bank accounts of former Minister of Sanitation and Water Resources Cecilia Bnadapa. One account contained 48 million Ghana cities and another contained $5 million, the sources said. This forms part of an investigation into the circumstances that led to the former government appointee keeping such huge amounts of money in her home. Madame Cecilia Dapa tendered her resignation in a letter to President Nanado Dankwa Kufadu on Saturday, July 22, barely 24 hours after news of some foreign cash stolen from her bedroom came to light. Ghana is suffering a major leadership crisis. That is a damning verdict of some of the country's most accomplished politicians and experts who joined three business for the latest in its series of thought leadership lectures. At some point, uh, I just ask myself, so who are the leaders? Who, who is leading us? You have people who are, have not been voted for, they have no position anywhere, but they appear to be taking decisions and, and deciding for us and disrespecting us. A leader is somebody who has a vision. But more important, the leader has to have around him executing capacity, executing. That the capacity to execute the vision. Economist Professor Godfred Bob King has stirred attention, suggesting that the country's current dire economic challenges could potentially be overcome within the span of the next three decades. According to him, the delay in the country heading to the IMF crisis of the Bank of Ghana, coupled amongst others, requires serious governance reforms in their immediacy. In all of these things, because leadership first failed, it is the governance failures that is manifesting explicitly in economic mismanagement, financial improprieties, procurement breaches, and the rest of them. It's a governance. <laughs> A Deputy Minister of Trade and Industry, Dr. Stephen Amwa, has challenged the NDC minority in Parliament to provide specific details on the central bank's governor's wrongdoing before requesting his resignation. He argues that the bank's 2022 report does not suggest any wrongdoing. Central banks, reserve banks, all over the world are having problems, and they support the government or otherwise to ensure stability. Why are they doing all these things? So they should back all these things with the needed legal whatever it is. And also they should check whether Bank of Ghana's financial statement does not actually reflect the uh, international financial reporting standards. Whether there is materiality issues, whether the expenditures Bank of Ghana had, has made, there are no material evidence to underpin. <laughs> The World Bank says it is halting new loans to Uganda because its new anti-gay law contradicts its core values. 
homosexual acts were already illegal in Uganda, but anyone now convicted faces life imprisonment under a new law which was enacted in May. A founding member of the New Patriotic Party, Dr. Nyaho Nyaho Tamaklu, has called for government to reconsider its decision to contribute troops to the ECOWAS intervention in Niger, while citing concerns over potential implications and the need for a comprehensive diplomatic approach. Dr. Nyaho Tamaklu says the country's military is not equipped for such exercises. This is a pure infantry work. You are fighting an infantry battle. This has nothing to do with Navy or Air Force. The Air Force, we, are, we don't even have the aircraft. What sort of contribution are we going to give? We have to assess ourselves first. And with the two brigades, any good commander will advise his government, a particular Ghana government, not to get involved in this military. <laughs> Oh, there's more news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. This is Ghana Tonight. Now, let's, let's, let's stay a bit further on uh, Dr. Nyaonyo Tabanko because he makes the point about the fact that if politicians, in his words, return monies stolen and shipped out of this country, it would help in the recovery process from this economic crisis that we find ourselves in. It was one of many other things that he said during the Three Business TV3 Leadership Forum earlier today. Absolutely leadership. And let me say that I would like to just equate leadership in general with that of the military because I have experience in that. A leader must, number one, know his people. and know exactly what they want. He must have integrity. Integrity. Absolutely. Without that, forget about it. Does the current leadership we have as a country have integrity? Absolutely no. The, the I say no. They don't have integrity. I say no. Why do I say that? Tell me. I'll cite an example. I will still be used in the military. Well, I have that background experience. I've right. been a soldier before. In the military, we have hierarchies. Our army is a small army, but in even big armies, you see where you have, a, where you have a field marshals and whatnot. So here, I will take it from our own perspective here. When a commander, let, let's go to a, just a battalion level. When a commander of a battalion The leader of the battalion. He knows he's a leader. That's right. He knows exactly what the battalion wants. He has got subordinates. We have various sessions. Battalion will give you a number of uh, uh, what sessions will give you a company, a number of companies will give you uh, what do you call it? A battalion. He knows whom to appoint at a particular place. And the most important thing is that he puts his ears always on the ground for a feedback. Sure. So if he finds you to be incompetent, he removes you immediately. You don't see that playing out in, in this current leadership? Look, our biggest problem to me in Ghana, if not in Africa, is the inability for the Ghanaian leader to say no on principle and take his pen, the culture of resignation, we don't know it. Well, but he, the president has always defended his um, appointees, say that they're, he reviews their performance on a daily basis and they are doing well, they are meeting his expectations. That's why I use the word integrity. If he has it, he will never dare. No, you are not doing well as a leader. Your subordinates are not doing well. This is no, I mean, it's known to every Ghanaian. Even children know that. This country is running on autopilot at the moment. The country is running on autopilot. Absolutely, I'm telling you. I have been, NPP is my party. Indeed. 
and I can say anything. No one can do anything to me. What I'm saying, what this cannot say. And what hurts me is that the younger ones coming are not learning from the mistakes of some of the leaders at the moment, but they are copying the mistakes. We'll have more of Dr. Nyaudan Tamaklo and the other speakers who spoke earlier today at the Three Business TV3 uh, Leadership Forum here on Ghana tonight. There's a conversation that we're building on the back of a number of things that they said. But coming up tonight, another twist in the matter of the stolen cash from the home of the former sanitation minister, Cecilia Abnadapa, as the Office of Special Prosecutor in the Senate has frozen her bank accounts containing substantial amounts of money in dollars and cities some interesting details are playing out and yesterday we laid a foundation and chronicling how this case has traveled right from the get-go with the number of suspects four increasing to five and yesterday we got to know about eight and then also some very interesting detail in the chart sheet the amended chart sheet that we showed you yesterday now on what basis or in, in what specific case of the law is the special prosecutor going ahead now to freeze the accounts of Cecilia Dapa? There's something also in reference to what was found in her two houses in Abelimpe and Cantonments. We'll get to that. My colleague Dennis Paveri Wadam has been studying the updates on this case. He joins me. Dennis, what do we know? Well, so the latest is that the bank accounts, two of them, one a CD account and the other a dollar account of the former Minister of Sanitation and Water Resources, Cecilia Abinadapa, uh, have been frozen by the Office of the Special Prosecutor. Um, this is coming on the back of the arrest that was effected on the 24th of July, 2023, um, where she was um, committed to bail. Thereafter, she was, I mean, her home was searched and thereafter, um, we were told that some investigations were going on. So this is part of the whole investigation that the Office of the Special Prosecutor is doing in respect of the huge sums of money that were found in her house, which have also become the subject of um, controversy under which some eight persons are now standing trial or mm -hmm. being accused for having stolen those money. So that is the basis for it. The latest noun is that the bank accounts of the former minister have been frozen by the Office of the Special Prosecutor. In fact, so on, the, on, on what laws has OSP now freezing the accounts? What well, you know? so when you come through the um, Office of the Special Prosecutors Act 2007, Act 959, mm -hmm. you would notice that Section 38 of the Act empowers the Special Prosecutor to, as part of investigations where he deems necessary, to um, direct the freezing of the property of a person or entity which is being investigated, and also specified property held by a person or entity other than the person or entity being investigated or prosecuted. Now, the, the special prosecutor has within 14 days after the freezing of the property to apply to the court for a confirmation of the freezing. And that is what um, Section 38 of the OSP Act says. Now, this is to suggest that, I mean, we gather now that um, this application has now been made. Mm -hmm. when, so when you look at Section 39, it talks about the Office of the Special Prosecutor within 14 days making an application to the court so that the freezing um, order, I mean, so that the, the, the court will affirm the freezing order for him to continue the investigation. So when you do the calculation between 24th of July, when the, office, um, the, minister, the former minister was arrested and when investigation started, Monday would have been the 14th day. What we are now learning is that the Office of the Special Prosecutor has made an official application to the courts okay. so that that freezing order will be affirmed. And we also understand that this um, application will be heard in the courts in the coming days, specifically on Thursday. Next, you mean next week, Thursday? Next week, th yes, in the coming Thursday. I mean, this you Thursday. mean tomorrow? Tomorrow is Thursday, yes. Tomorrow is Thursday. Thursday, yes. I see. So that is what we are gathering. And um, we are also looking at on what basis that this order may be, or the application may be granted by the court. So when you look at Section 40, it provides the instances 
um, and uh, which the court will satisfy itself before granting an order for freezing um, the account of somebody. So you'd find that the first one talks about if the respondent is being investigated for corruption or corruption-related offenses. Mm -hmm. Mind you, the reason we have a respondent here is that the application by its nature has to be on notice. What it means is that the person whose account you are seeking to freeze has to be informed that this is what is going to happen. The person has to be served of the processes and the person will have the right to also be heard. So before the court will come to that conclusion, it, has, it must satisfy itself that mm -hmm. this person you are talking about is being investigated for corruption and corruption-related offenses. What we do know, per the statement of the Office of the Special Prosecutor on the 24th of July, was that the former minister was under arrest in respect of corruption and corruption-related offenses. offenses. So that gives us an idea of exactly what o OSP is doing. It also talks about the fact that the respondent has to be charged with corruption or corruption-related offenses. As it stands now, we are unaware officially that the former minister has been charged. What we only know is that she's under investigation. But that is also something that the court will be looking out for um, in granting that particular freezing order. There's also debate about reasonable grounds to believe that the property is tainted. Okay. Now, the property here we're talking about is money. Mm -hmm. or, yes, so the question of, as to whether the money is tainted or not will also arise, and that the court will also have to satisfy itself before granting that particular order. So there are quite a number of things that the court will have to look at in granting that uh, particular order. But what we do know for now is that the two bank accounts, which we understand contain some substantial amount of money, have been frozen, Alfred. Interesting points there. And now, so the, the way things are playing out, it, it points to some, some questions, um, you know, because, Dennis, if this money's, um, you know, some reports have quoted millions of dollars and, 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 and CDs as well were lodged in a bank account. There are questions now raised about what this said bank or the financial institution, questions they asked about the source of the money and, and, and how much the money was even building up within which a particular period to that said you know, amount of the dollars in those, th that particular account as well, whether there were, there were that due diligence by that particular financial institution. And that's why we want to get a bit more into this. Mariada is the uh, acting executive director of the Ghana Integrity Initiative. Also joining us is Professor Kojo Apieje Etia. He is a, a professor of law and also a lecturer at the University of Ghana Law School. Gentlemen. Uh, sorry, lady and gentlemen, good evening. Good Thank good you good so good much good. for joining us on Ghana tonight. Professor Jaya, let me first of all take your thoughts on the freezing of this, the account of Cicely Adapa by the OSP and the details of the law that my colleague Dennis has just uh, put out. In the first place, um, as you know, the The Office of the Special Prosecutor has the powers of a police officer as defined under the Criminal and Other Offenses Act. And so there are certain situations where the Office of the Special Prosecutor can act without a resort to the courts. And that is where uh, we, are talking, we are talking about the issue of the freezing of the assets, where there is the fear or concern that the assets may be moved to a new place or it may hinder investigations and, uh, or uh, the prosecution of the case. In, that, in such a situation, the, the Office of the Special Prosecutor can act on his own powers to cause the freezing of the assets. However, the Office of the Special Prosecutor will have to proceed to court within seven days to confirm the, the, the freezing of the assets and to justify why the, the freezing is necessary in connection with the prosecution 
or the investigation of the case. I see. And uh, Merida is also joining us now. Um, Mary, so you you also been following this case quite closely. From the anti-corruption perspective, the, the step taken by the special prosecutor in freezing the accounts of Cecilia Dapa, and then we understand already that uh, the, the, the court documents revealing that he has actually filed a motion to seize the funds which were also that's the monies found in her two houses that is in the abelimpe and the cantonment houses in addition to the money in the accounts as well that's what's happening now mary hello We'll try and uh, reconnect and get that clarity and connection um, to Merida. But, but just the same question to you, Professor Chair. Um, this particular move by the special prosecutor to not only freeze the accounts of, of Cecilia Dapa, but also we understand that he is also going through a motion to, to seize the money that was found at the two residences of Cecilia Dapa, the Abelimpe one, and the and the cantonment ones as well, Prof. The, the court will determine the number of days that the freezing can take place, and so if more time is needed, then the OSP will have to go to court, and that is what it has done in this case because there was already a freezing, and I think the time frame, either within the the act or by as is uh, determined by the court is coming to an end. So uh, um, according to the the Office of the Special Prosecutor, uh, that act, it's, uh, the office has to go back to the courts to, to call for extension and to give reasons for the call for the extension. And this is done on notice. So it means that the respondents will have the option to, to also determine or to, to fight against the extension of the freezing, for example. Mary, if, if you can hear me now, I was asking about from the anti-corruption perspective, this move by the OSP, uh, what, what you, how does this strike you? That is she, he's not only focusing on freezing the details, that's the cash in the two accounts belonging to Cecilia Dapa, but also to seize the monies that were found in her two houses. Thank you very much, Alfred. Good evening and good evening to my co-panelists and to your viewers as well. It is heartwarming to, for once, uh, know that uh, an institution is working and working expeditiously from the civil society and also anti-corruption perspective. We believe this is very, very timely. And then also, if you remember the last time I mentioned that it is not just about what has been uncovered, what about what hasn't been. Today, we are all hearing that the OSP's office made a significant discovery, which they want the court to then help them to continue to freeze. We think that is very good for us, apart from helping them to continue to freeze they would also then they are talking about other accounts that even go beyond what they have located and so it means that at this particular time we are particularly happy that this is going on and we only urge that more of this should happen and not just for the osp but also within and without the anti-corruption space. So that will make significant gains for this country. What we are all seeking is the truth. And if the truth is then found, uh, the OSP in going to court will then determine if the assets are also indeed frozen, then it means it gives them more time to delve into other aspects of this case. And we believe it is very good in the fight against corruption. Another thing I wanted to say would be that uh, looking at an institution of state, state that is carrying on this investigation with such panache and also mm -hmm. looking at it from a, a very 
fair perspective. That is what they are supposed to be doing. So doing this and doing it timelessly and also not recognizing the fact that this is a person who is within government, this is a person who is a cabinet minister, and this is a person who is held in high esteem within the governing party. This is only, uh, or it is an indication that when given the opportunity, the powers or the apparatus of state would do their work. And we only hope that the other organs which would be taking over or which would be adjudicating this process would also look at it from that point of view and help Ghanaians to benefit from mm -hmm. uh, some of these cases because right. it's, it also then breeds the trust we all want to see in the fight against corruption. And so in that we've been showing you our viewers the... Um the suspects yesterday when they appeared in court, those are the visuals we were showing you earlier, the, the ex-boyfriend, current boyfriend, and then also the other house help as well as happened in court yesterday. But for you, and maybe this is in 30 seconds, how should this case travel to ensure that the outcome will be trusted by all, especially what the special prosecutor is doing? And I'm saying this because of the kind of reaction that the likes of you had to the attorney general's advice on this particular case of which yesterday the details of the charge amended charge sheet points to something contrary certainly and let me say i spoke on another platform and made the case that in the bruhaha that we saw ensue between the uh, police as they continue to stick to their guns and came out yesterday to confirm as such that the monies they are talking about belonged to the former honorable minister. So it then begs the question why the attorney general is so interested in this issue. We know he is the attorney of state. We know he's supposed to prefer uh, advice when it is important and we know it is on his authority that the police is uh, prosecuting and so he would have a hand in some of this but then it continues to then breed uh, the suspicion that the people of Ghana have that when people are in power it becomes very difficult to uh, investigate and prosecute such people so we have said that it is very important for the credibility of the Attorney General's office and also for this case that the Attorney General looks back, reflects, and then perhaps maybe redraw from some of the things they are doing. Uh, admittedly, some of the advice they have preferred is good. We have mentioned that, but we believe that uh, independence of the state institution, that is the police service, in carrying out this um, case when it comes to the part on stealing uh, should be allowed so that they do their work and do it well on the part of what the osp is doing which is clearly different from what the police are also doing we we believe that till now we have not seen any heckling or any interference happen let's see how the process goes and like i said the other organs of government would also be called to attention because we believe that uh, when we all work together, civil society talking, media talking, the OSP doing his part by investigating and rolling out the net to even catch more or bring out more information, then the others who are also then mandated to do the rest, like the court, should also then do so without fear or favor because okay. the court is a place where justice is said okay. so let's see how that goes out indeed mary i appreciate your time and and professor chair before i let you go that same concern about uh the the ag and as well the the conduct in this so as not to to lend to that suspicion that is widely held by many members of general public that there's some attempt to to cover up or to interfere in this particular process of investigation to the Cecilia Adapa case? Yes, you know, when, when the Attorney General decided to step in, that concern was raised. 
and but uh, legally the attorney general has that power in terms of the fact that the osp's powers are limited uh, related to limited to corruption and corruption related cases and even the kind of people who are alleged to have been involved in corruption and so with regard to stealing money laundering issues coming in definitely the attorney general had but people had concerns of the, the the fact that the attorney general in some respects has not shown is um, that office to be really independent as for example the osp has proven to to us at least at this stage of um, this particular case and so it, it fits into the narrative that certainly something the, the osp uh, sorry the attorney general's office has something um, to to hide if i may put it so for, for want of a better word and so uh, it, it, the attorney general's office needs to be clear and make sure that that perception that people have about that office will be will be cleared so that its independence will also be confirmed and be able to perform and work in tandem with the osp to be able to unravel the mystery surrounding this case and bring it to an end where justice will prevail Prof, thank you so much uh, for your thoughts on this. Really appreciate it, Prof. Kujo Apuje Etia. He is a lecturer at the University of Ghana Law School. Also to you, Mary Ada, acting as a director of the Ghana Integrity Initiative. And coming up next, after this quick break here on Ghana Tonight, renowned statesman concerned about the leadership of Ghana in a the, the three business forum held earlier today. We'll bring you excerpts of that forum, including a conversation on, on the aspect of leadership and also the Bank of Ghana statement that is just coming through as well because like so Professor Godfrey Bokin raised fundamental concerns about the state of affairs with the Bank of Ghana's financing in, in the books with respect to the loss of 60 billion over 60 billion that was posted at the end of 2022 there's a statement from the Bank of Ghana tonight we're getting to that plus more stay with us Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to demonstrate to you the superior properties of Flamingo paint as compared to other paint brands on the market. We take equal quantities of Flamingo paint and this ordinary paint. We then dilute them with water. And now, let the test begin. The gentleman on the left is going to apply the ordinary paint and the gentleman on my right will use the Flamingo superior paint. As you can clearly see, Flamingo has the obvious better hiding. Furthermore, Flamingo has painted a much larger area. You know, one bucket of Flamingo paint is equal to several buckets of any other paint brand on the market. Flamingo paint is made with superior formulation to give superior durability, superior hiding, superior coverage. Flamingo paint, simply superior. Oh Jam, you're looking good oh my friend. Is there something you're not telling me? Yes, I'm feeling very good and strong. What is the secret? It is not a secret. My farmer used Yara Mela Activa on me two weeks after planting. This boosted my growth. Then after, he used Yara Bella Sulfan as top dressing when I was at knee length. My goodness and strength is because of Yara Mela Activa and Yara Bella Sulfan. Yara fertilizers have nitrite-based fertilizers that are readily available for plant upkeep and do not over acidify the soil. Yara fertilizers also contain micronutrients such as zinc, boron and manganese, which aid in yield and crop quality. If you want to look good like me, then your farmer must go for Yara fertilizers. They are available in accredited agri-input shops nationwide. For more information, call 0308-251-060 or visit our webpage at yara.com.gh or Facebook page. And there is more. Yara retailers can also benefit from selling Yara products by just downloading Yara Connect app and scanning QR codes on the Yara sack at the point of sale. To end rewards, use Yara fertilizers for better yields and quality produce. Everybody knows Acrobato. And if you know Acrobato, it means you know M Punch Homeopathy Clinic. M Punch Homeopathy Clinic is my pillar. Let's hear what others are saying about M Punch. 
from your party clinic. Who be careful at point one? Pa. Yes, and I'm young, I'm a problem. Let's say problems room. It's not my own idea, mommy. Papa, patches and any other some kitua. I'm quite points, you know. I'm shaming my gem, no, maybe be another some woman drew. Mommy, do I'm a fine, and my own cram, you know. Who for one, I'm quite more. Eba, and everything yourself. Mamma, I know what you do. And the whole wound to me, Nancy. And then you call end point, a moment in Ra, and then the white dear, what's me a sorry, Nancy. That's end point for you. Of our brother, hello. Hey, I'm sure what chair. Okay, a free bra would be end point, what does it? I'm a quiet, you know. Me just to say my name, Koye, and pass one of my men in and I'm a Gina Sabema. Now, when we fear for you, the one in the Jarasa. You read everything. I have secret. M point is my secret. M point homeopathic clinic. I'm free. Hey, hey, what do you do with some cool two thousand dollars? Okay, okay, okay. Here to win game show is exactly what you need. Game show when you are already rich before you begin to pay. Every week, two lucky people stand the chance of winning money. All you have to do is go through some quizzes and fun games. Somebody from Peru is called Perushin. Eh? Whatever you say, you have to be proud because your family people are watching. Somebody from Madagascar is called Malagasy. Correct! Okay, let's go, let's go. Uh -uh. It's you that will tell me, let's go. <laughs> you are not even winning. <laughs> okay. 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 Amazing. Right. Just go. Just go. Just go. Be proud. Okay. First of all, is Aikwe supposed to be a man or a woman? Put it on your forehead. Aikwe. <laughs> be a part of this game show right here on TV3 and take on some Come join us on Here to Win Game Show where you win it all. Hey, mama. Hey, mama. Hey, Here to Win! Here to Win premiering on Saturday, 12 August at 8 pm on TV3. Brought to you by Kill It Insecticide Spray. It is very difficult. The Romans had a saying, who, who guards the guardians? You know, you put at the gate of Rome. The gate on the financiers of Bank of Ghana, insurance company. So if they cannot maintain a certain level of prudence, uh, that, that's why I'm saying that the problem is dire. And some of these things should not be public discussion. Mm. It should be behind the scenes because the people outside, they are taking a look at us. Normally, when you have an IMF program, immediately you sign. The big boys are in the room. The boys will behave. The economy starts picking up. Investors start coming in. Now, it's not happening. Why? Because the problem, as I see it, Historically, I've been seeing it before anywhere in the world. Not seen it before. What's happening no, in this What country? is happening in this country and how we are going to get out of it? The business community doesn't seem to realize that because when they were negotiating, the association of bankers was negotiating for the banks. Are they shareholders in the banks? I think for the first time during all this economic crisis, the Minister for Finance in a statement to Parliament said, we are in a deep crisis. We haven't heard that before. And the crisis we are in now, we've never been there before. We are bankrupt as a nation. We are having it difficult to pay salaries. Teachers, nurses who have been to allowances are not being paid. Mm -hmm. We are finding it difficult to pay government bonds. You know, banks, insurance companies are asked to put their monies in government bonds, because it's safe. Yes. Now, it is not safe. It took us a long time to get uh, Ghanaians to put their monies in banks. Well, celebrated economist Kwame Pianing there. Now, this was during the Three Business TV3 Leadership Summit earlier today. The Bank of Ghana has issued a statement 
in response to this and a number of things, including the, the new headquarters they are building, which the NDC raised yesterday at the press conference. This is the statement from the Bank of Ghana. They are insisting that the 60, over 60 billion cities loss in 2022 has very little implication for the operations of the Bank of Ghana because as a central bank, it is not a commercial bank and cannot be insolvent or bankrupt. The Bank of Ghana, in this statement you are seeing, which came through tonight, saying that its earlier position that much of the losses were occasioned by the government's domestic debt exchange program, uh, indeed, is what it is. And in, in fact, as a result, they have already sovereign spreads on Ghana bonds widened, signaling investor dissatisfaction with the stance of fiscal policy and so on. And that the budget for 2022, which was read in 2021, failed to address the fiscal concerns as the budget was even more expansionary by about 23% with a raft of revenue measures to raise financing and so on and so forth. And that this matter was actually tabled before Parliament by the Finance Minister when he briefed them on the domestic debt action program and other things. That's in the statement from the Bank of Ghana that you see on the screen. And Professor John Gachi is the Dean of the University of Cape Coast Business School. He's joining us on Zoom. Thank you so much, Professor Gachi, for your time. Now, this is the position of the Bank of Ghana. In fact, they are reiterating a number of things, including the fact that central banks are not commercial banks. So technically, central banks cannot be insolvent or bankrupt. Is that consistent with what the structure and workings of the central bank should be? There is no. No, because central banks cannot be technically insolvent. That does not mean that is not the reality. The reality is that when we look at the financial statement of central bank of Ghana, it shows that the liabilities are more than the asset of the bank. And that is what we are saying. The central bank is in the situation that it cannot pay its liabilities. The central bank in a situation which is called insolvency. So the central bank cannot impose it on us that for them it is called technically not insolvent. No. Uh, we keep saying in fact, there is a reason why in selecting the board of the central bank, the act says that one person at least should be a chartered accountant. It is because of the importance placed on financial statement. So for the central bank who, who, uh, trying to let us know that financial statement is not important, if financial statement indicate that that is something that is that uh, stakeholders should not be happy about. Uh, the central bank will wish it away. That will not be continent. That will not be encouraged. Commercial banks are, are in business to make profits. And central bank cannot be bold and say that they are in their business to make losses. No. It is the same financial statement, the way we analyze the financial statement of commercial banks, it, it is in the same way we analyze the financial statement of uh, central banks. We have various financial ratios. Some of them has to do with whether or not those in the affairs of uh, the central bank have managed the institution well or not. I see. But I'm looking through the statement. They also reiterate the point that this over 60 billion loss has very little implications for the operations of them, that's the central bank. Is this position consistent with the details of this financial statement of 2022 that has been published? Posted losses. Some central bank have posted losses mm -hmm. for reasons different from what the the government of, uh, i mean the central bank of ghana has uh, as adduce for example today the central bank is releasing a statement that the problem started from 2019 okay the central bank is now saying that they have a, a issue bond of about 10 billion covid bond 
And that time, 10 billion, at the time that the central bank was doing that, the central bank did not go to parliament. The central bank is now telling us that they went to parliament after DDEP. The question is, is that the requirement of the law? The answer is no. So all that the central bank is saying is not adding up. The point is that the bank is not individual banks. The bank is a state institution and it has stakeholders. If stakeholders express misgiving about what they have done, I believe the central bank's duty is to uh, let the stakeholders know that within five years, within two years, within three years, they will start seeing the balance sheet of the central bank positive. And these are the steps they have taken to ensure that they reach that goal. It is not the duty of the central bank to tell us that losing 60 billion in one year should be wished away. That must not be wished away. So the central bank must get this clear. And the central bank is only supposed to support government activities 5% of previous year's uh, tax revenue. When epidemic or whatever have been declared, when that have been declared, the rule is that the governor, the controller, accountant general, and the minister of finance should meet and determine the extent of the excess that will be allowed by Bank of Ghana to lend to government. The question is, have you ever heard the Bank of Ghana announce any excess? No. So that rule is not for open-ended utilization of the resources of Bank of Ghana on all activities of, of the government. The central bank is behaving as if when the government of Ghana mismanages its fiscal activities, it is their duty to just come in and clear the mess. That is not what the law anticipates. So the central bank should get it clear. Right. Professor Chongachi, appreciate your time. Thank you very much for joining us here on Ghana tonight, Dean of University of Cape Coast Business School, and uh, still staying with the three business leadership forum. The Bank of Ghana has responded to a number of things, but there's also another leg of the conversation, which is leadership. And this is Professor Kovnaf and Pombo uh, submission earlier today. Sometimes, at some point, uh, I just ask myself, so who are the leaders? But you ask who are the leaders? Yes. If, we, if who, who is leading us? The president. You know, uh, yes. Theoretically, yes. I mean, we vote for somebody to lead us. Indeed. But then you have people who are, have not been voted for, they have no position anywhere, but they appear to be taking decisions and, and deciding for us and disrespecting us. So, you, you know, in some countries, there will be people behind the scenes from various backgrounds, political, ethnic, who meet and decide or, and say that, look, this is our country. Mm -hmm. We are not going to make it go down. Yeah. And therefore, they help take decisions. I mean, and I don't think we have anything like that here. Mm -hmm. A body that is supposed to do that it's not doing that. Well, that's the Council of States. Um... Well, that, I don't know whether the Council of State is doing that, you know. Uh, so what I'm saying is that we need to identify who our leaders are. It's Professor Kovna from Pombo in there. Professor Enoch Enchi Opoku is also a leadership expert. He's joining us on Zoom. Thank you for time uh, on Ghana tonight. Insanity, they say, is uh, doing the same things and expecting different results. So what has to change in this leadership structure that we have as a country you are afraid a leadership is too important to be left leaders alone and leadership is common when we say leadership is common it means even in the animal world there are leadership so when elephants are moving the wise elephant among them uh, is their leader when you see bees the one who can dance very well 
is their leader. When you see even ants crawling on the ground, there's a leader there. When you see baboons there, there's one sitting on top of the tree guiding and seeing if there's somebody coming so that that baboon can give an alarm and everybody can run for shelter. So leadership is even in the animal world. And that is why in the human world, we need leadership. But I have said on many platforms that 80% of leadership is followership. That's what the research has shown. So unfortunately in Africa, we are allowing the 20% to control the 80%. And for some reason, nobody wants to talk about the wrongs in leadership. That's not how it's supposed to be. So leaders use everyday ingenuity to solve problems, big and small. That is why we need leadership. And leadership is a universal phenomenon across all cultures. So everywhere you go, in every society, big or small, we need leaders. And because we are groups, you know, we are a big group called Ghana. And every group needs a leader because the simple definition of leadership is an individual influencing another individual or a group of people to achieve a common goal. As a country, we have a common goal. And these common goals are in governance. And in governance, we are preserving the values. So, Professor Inti, what is wrong? And you see, there, there has to be that deficiency, which is also now the basis for the call for something else to change. So what has to change so that all of us, the people, will benefit from the kind of democracy that we are practicing now, which clearly it's not benefiting the people down the ladder? Well, I've seen a lot of argument. People are saying that we don't need democracy, but we do. Because Africa alone has over 3,000 different languages. If you have that kind of huge diversity, then democracy should be the only way that everybody's voice will be heard. But you know, Lord Acton said power corrupts, absolutely power corrupts, absolutely. But as in Sue, she said that it is not power that corrupts, it is the fear of losing power that corrupts many people in developing countries. So in Africa, we've had that kind of problem where the fear of losing power is really corrupting people. Once they get hold of power, the fear of losing it makes them so corrupt. So in our societies, the elites have power. And I've seen somebody, you know, define democracy now as government of the poor, you know, government of the rich, rather, for the rich, observed by the poor. So we have governance where rich people are into governance. And then if you want to contest them, then bring money because they have money to contest the election and give to delegates. If you don't have money, you cannot contest in elections. So it's become our democracy has become, most of our leaders now are not leaders. They are investors. They have invested money into politics and they are recouping it in a way from the people. But we need leaders. For me, anywhere that I've been, I am not a politician. Prof, appreciate your time and, and thank you very much for providing these solutions. Professor Eno Kenji Opoku is a leadership and governance expert. Thank you for time here on Ghana tonight. Coming up next, the World Bank has held back on some loans to Uganda because of the country's anti-LGBTQ plus law. Tonight, we ask if there is any cause for alarm or concern for Ghana, which is currently on the verge or going through the process of passing this anti-LGBTQ plus bill currently before Parliament. Now, if you recall, earlier, that's sometime last, last month, the Speaker of Parliament, Alban Sumanakis for Bagwin Right Honourable, stated his commitment to ensure that Parliament passes this bill into law before the end of the year. Take a look. The data is very clear. In 50 years' time, there will be no Europe. It's perished. It's only no Europeans that will be in Europe. America, 100 years. And so they know that they are going and they want us to follow. We will not do that. We won't follow them. You can see beautiful ladies like this and, uh, you know. Fine, fine, handsome gentlemen. <laughs> but that one is even the easier part when you talk about gayism, lesbianism, and no, 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 that is easy. When you go to the queer, where somebody gets up to say that me, I want to be like a cat. I 
feel like it. I want to behave like a cat. I want to do this. And me, I want to marry a dog. Then they take the person and the dog and go and wait. And you, what? you say this is a human right? Even this is not animal left. All right, so that's the Speaker of Parliament there. But uh, let's go on to the telephone. Nelson Roxon Dafiame Poe is Member of Parliament for the South Dai constituency. Also one of the sponsors of this anti-LGBTQ plus bill currently going through parliamentary process. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. You, you've heard what's happened in Uganda, right? Are you the sponsors of this anti-LGBTQ plus bill in Ghana concerned about the possibility of this playing out in Ghana if this bill becomes law eventually? Well, uh, let me, thank you very much. Let me say that uh, Ghana is not perturbed by what's happening in Uganda. In any case, the World Bank is a bank for for all of us. So it's not a bank for some group of people in this world, minus Africa. Africa has 54 nations. And I think that if the World Bank wants to blackmail Africa into a certain LGBTQ practices, I think um, they, are, they, are, they are wrong. They are, they are biting more than they can chew. We will not back down today, we will not back down tomorrow. The, we have a right to seek funding or loans from the World Bank as a member. They cannot deny an African country which is a member of the World Bank group. The World Bank is set up with, with the funding from every, every, every nation in this world. So. I, I I heard the news. I was spoken to a few of my colleagues. My, but the leader of our group, Honorable Emmanuel Christopher has already granted some interviews. We remain resolute as a country in passing this legislation, and no threat or intimidation from any country or any international organization will cower us into submission. We have already indicated clearly that. It even appears that we, the sponsors of the of this legislation, we have been blacklisted and may not be granted visas to travel to some other countries. But that is also not a border for us. Well, say, but this concern of uh, donors and other agencies withholding funding from Ghana if this bill becomes law was expressed by some people. Okay, but the reality is that we're still depending on these multilateral agencies or multinational agencies and then also these donors for for funding okay so if we are confronted with this reality that uganda is faced with now can we get out of that situation if it happens is this saudi arabia part of the world bank group don't they have the right to take loans from the world bank isn't isn't all the Muslim countries part of the World Bank group and the IMF? Don't they take funding from the World Bank? Ghana is not the first country, or uh, Uganda is not the first country to have passed an anti LGBT law. An European country called Hungary mm -hmm. has passed an anti LGBT law. Why hasn't the World Bank asked them or told them that they will, they will seek funding to Hungary anytime they come for loans or financial assistance? So clearly, it, it's, another, it's another opportunity for them to exhibit racist tendencies. It's another opportunity for them to, um, to exhibit tendencies by, by intimidating us, blackmailing us, and to, to cower under pressure and abandon this project. So it won't happen in Uganda, and it won't happen in Ghana. Nelson Roxon Dafiame Po is Member of Parliament representing the South Dyke constituency on the sponsors of this anti LGBTQ plus bill in Parliament. Thank you. On that note, I want to say thank you so much for staying with us here on Ghana tonight. Join us same time tomorrow. I am Alfred Okonse. Have a good night. Ghana Tonight is brought to you by Flamingo Paint, superior durability, superior hiding, superior coverage, simply superior.